what we are seeking to do in these Sundays, both morning and evening before Easter, is to trace, as it were, the progress of our Lord through the days of His humiliation on His way to Calvary and to suffer and die in our place for our sin. We have already sought to learn from His experience in Gethsemane in all the nameless anguish of staring into what it meant for him, the Holy One, to bear away our sin. We have watched Jesus betrayed by Judas, disowned by Peter, and then deserted by the remaining ten of his disciples. Today, at both services, we will be going with Jesus into the two places where he was subjected first to a religious and then to a civil trial. You will remember that after Judas fulfilled his promise and did what he had been paid that miserable sum to do, he came and identified Jesus, and they brought him under arrest, first of all before Caiaphas, the high priest, for a religious trial before the Sanhedrin, the ultimate court of authority for the whole of Judaism then. And then he was taken from there to the civil court under Pilate's jurisdiction. That extraordinary moment when this minor Roman official that nobody would ever have heard about, apart from the fact that all over the world this morning there will be people in Christian communions who recite the creed, who will be saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate. In so many ways, both of these trials belong together. They occurred on the same day, And they are all part of the process of bringing Jesus to the place of judgment and of death. Together, they are extraordinary events by any measurement. Perhaps the most extraordinary thing about them is that here you have the world of evil gathered together perhaps reaching its apex in what we read at the close of this passage, a world suffused with guilt and ripe for judgment. And here they are reaching a verdict of guilty on Jesus Christ, their Creator and their Judge, who before the end of all things, will look upon them bowing their knees before him and acknowledging in confusion, if not in faith, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But this morning I want us to turn to Matthew 27, uh, 26, rather, and to the passage we read at verse 57, to Jesus before the religious court of the Sanhedrin, and especially before Caiaphas, the high priest. There are three things that Matthew focuses our attention on. Let me just briefly mention them to you, and they will be in your mind, I hope, 
as we look together at this passage. The first thing that Matthew seems to draw our attention to, and he does it again in chapter 27 at the trial before Pilate, is the silence of Jesus. You would notice it in verses 62 and 63. Are you not going to answer, says Caiaphas? Pilate later in chapter 27 says, Will you not answer me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And Jesus said not a word. In verse 63 of this chapter we read, But Jesus remained silent. And the silence of Jesus is of some significance. The second thing he focuses our attention on is the glory of Jesus in verse 64, when ultimately he speaks it is to bear testimony to himself. And whereas they have listened to the false testimony of false witnesses, now the faithful and true witness, the Lord Jesus Christ, reveals to them something of his infinite glory. And then at the end, in verses 65 to 68, there is the rejection of Jesus. They spat in his face and struck him with their fists. May we try to understand, as God helps us, even a little of what these verses are saying to us. First, the silence of Jesus in his trial before Caiaphas. It is, of course, not an unusual thing for somebody who is accused and brought before their judges to remain silent. That's almost a normal reaction for some. It may be the silence of resignation, that they recognize the impossibility of finding true justice in such a place as this. It may be the silence of frustration that they are listening to trumped-up charges and so on. It may be the silence, perhaps more often, of self-protection. Don't say a word unless you incriminate yourself. Or more nobly, it may be for the sake of protecting other people. But the silence of Jesus was none of these things. The silence of Jesus was not the silence of resignation or frustration or protection of himself or others. The silence of Jesus really has its roots in two things. First of all, in his innocence. As he refused to engage in the discussion and in the interrogation that arose from these false witnesses, the Lord Jesus Christ has such assurance of his own absolute innocence and purity that he has no need to answer. And his innocence is something Pilate later on identifies as one of the mysteries to him. Why is it that they want to hound him so? He says, will you not that I release to you Jesus of Nazareth? I can find no fault in him. And manifestly, the silence of Jesus is the silence of innocence. You will recollect how these two false witnesses came, having scoured the countryside, the Sanhedrin found two people who would come with something that was almost credible, and the only element of credibility in it was that they had taken up a statement of Jesus which is recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 19, where he says, not what they say, this fellow said, 
I will pull down the temple and rebuild it in three days. In John chapter 2, Jesus says, If you destroy this temple, and John says he spoke of the temple of his body. And they were charging him now, of course, with sacrilege because they misrepresented what Jesus had originally said. But Jesus refused to answer because his innocence required no defense. He was about to see the fulfillment of that prophecy. The temple was his body. They were to tear it down and rend it, as it were, on that very day. And in three days, he would be raised again from the dead for our justification. But he comes in perfect innocence with no need to justify himself because he is not only the fulfillment of the temple from the Old Testament record, he is the fulfillment of that lamb long before the temple was built which was the Lamb of the Passover without blemish, do you remember, and without spot. And Jesus Christ, the innocent Lamb of God, without any blemish and without any spot that either man or God could see, is becoming the perfect sacrifice for sin. And in silence, he refuses to respond. But you notice in a moment, Caiaphas puts the question to him in a different way. He puts Jesus under oath in verse 62. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? And Jesus remained silent. But then the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ. Now at that point, Jesus is sworn by the high priest under oath to God, and he does begin to speak. But it's of great significance that the silence of Jesus is a silence of innocence and also a silence of obedience. Why is he silent? Because of his innocence, but then follow this with me. He not only fulfills the picture of the Passover lamb in its purity, he fulfills the picture of the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, of whom it is said, listen to this, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And here we have crowded together these Old Testament shadows brought to reality. Here is the temple of God about to be rent and then resurrected. Here is the Lamb of God, Christ our Passover, is sacrificed for us, says Paul. Here is the Lamb of God, without blemish and without spot. And Jesus 
is the obedient servant of God, who, being oppressed and afflicted, opened not his mouth. Peter picks that up and tells us that's how to deal with situations where people are accusing you unjustly. But here it is the obedience of the Savior who is God's suffering servant. The silence of Jesus is then of great importance in this whole episode of our Lord's Passion. But then you notice in verses 63 and 64 how when Jesus does open His lips, He begins to reveal to us the glory of Jesus Christ. And as the, what the book of Revelation calls the faithful and true witness, he speaks about himself and his true glory. It is as you say, verse 64, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you in future, you are going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, that statement that Jesus makes in verse 64 is almost completely a quotation from the book of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. Do you notice incidentally how our Lord is such an example to us. All His thinking about redemption and the work of redemption that God has given to Him. All His thinking about Himself in His person. All His thinking about His circumstances are shaped and molded from Scripture. Have you ever noticed the example of Jesus in this? My dear friends, if Jesus Christ needed thus to see life in all its confusion from Holy Scripture, how much more do we need to have all our thinking molded by Holy Scripture? This is an element in Christ-likeness. And Jesus is quoting from the book of Daniel where you will notice the Son of Man is a picture or figure of the Messiah, and here He is pictured in His glory. Notice the threefold glory of the Lord Jesus Christ that He describes to them from Daniel. It's the glory of an exalted Savior. I say to all of you in future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. Now that's the picture of the exalted Savior. All His work is ended. He has ascended into the glory and He sits down. Now the session as it is called of our Lord Jesus Christ that is, his being seated at the right hand of God is an evidence of the completion of his saving ministry. And he is pointing them to the fact that there is a glory which awaits him in the near future as he goes into the presence of the Father, the exalted Savior. But notice... He is also there as the enthroned king because he is at the right hand, as some of the versions put it, the right hand of the majesty, that is, of the king of kings and lord of lords. His seat is a throne, and there he reigns as he reigns this morning. And here are these petty authorities like Caiaphas, and Pilate, and so many others. 
and the Lord of glory, the sovereign Lord of the universe is there before them. You will see it, he says one day. And can you think of the utter incredible arrogance of sinners who are there standing in judgment upon them, Little men like Pilate do not know that I have got authority to do with you what I want. People like Caiaphas, will you not answer? Oh, we have too poor a vision of the enthroned and kingly glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But not only is he coming, Daniel chapter 7 describes him as the one who is seated in his kingdom so that all peoples, men of every nation and language will bow down to worship him. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. But not only is it the glory of an exalted Savior and an enthroned King, you will also notice it is the glory of an expected judge. I say to all of you in future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. What is He coming for? He is coming in judgment to sit on His throne and hold His last assize and call the whole of humankind before him. And they will be there, Jesus says, you will see in the future. You will see. The implication is that at the moment they are totally blind. Totally blind to the glory of Jesus Christ. That's the world's real plight this morning. Totally blind to the glory of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says you will see one day. That leads us to the last of the things Matthew focuses on, the silence of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. But you notice in verses 65 to 68, the rejection of Jesus. When Jesus quoted from Daniel 7, the high priest tore his clothes and says, He has spoken blasphemy. Of course, it would have been blasphemy if it hadn't been true. But part of his blindness was not to realize that it was true. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And so they would send him on to the Roman authorities since the Sanhedrin would not have the power to sentence someone to be crucified. And they said he is worthy of death. The rejection of Jesus takes a particularly debased form. Of course, they mock him. They mock him as prophet. One of the other Gospels tells us they actually had him blindfolded, and then they reached out and smote him and said, Now prophesy. Tell us which of us hit you. They prophesied. They, they mocked him as king. And in the next chapter, we read how they dressed him up in royal robes and put a crown of thorns on his head. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they mocked him as the great high priest and offerer of a sacrifice to God when they said, Come down from the cross. He saves others, so he says, but he cannot even save himself. But they showed how they despised him and rejected him by something that I think is probably agreed amongst us in most areas of civilization. 
as being one of the most debased things one human being can do to another, they spat upon him. I don't suppose there is anything else that is such an ugly insult as that. You ever had anybody spit upon you? I have, as a matter of fact. I'm glad to tell you not here in Glasgow. I'm almost as glad to tell you it was in Edinburgh. In fashionable George Street one day, in circumstances that don't really matter. But I've never realized till then what a foul and ugly and debased thing it is for someone to do to another. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he bore the anguish and the agony, not of his own guilt because their ultimate blindness was not to be able to see who was under judgment that day and where the guilt really lay. He was bearing their guilt, and he was about to bear it to Calvary. But you know the thing that that picture of the religious trial makes abundantly clear, and it's this. These who spat upon him were the most religious people in the land. And it's an evidence, is it not, of what depths of evil dead religion can reach. when it rejects Christ in his saving office as prophet, priest, and king. And that's not ancient history, my friends. That's not ancient history. It's one of the great warnings in Scripture, this scene, against dead religion. No matter what clothes it wears or what theological flavor it has, if it is the form of godliness but denying the power of it, then it's dead and deadly and disgusting. And so Jesus, the true high priest, the great high priest, goes out from their midst, the only noble figure amongst them, and whereas Caiaphas year after year could not do a thing to cleanse the consciences of men and women from the guilt and defilement of their sin, Jesus Christ was going out to be priest and victim and there to offer himself without spot to God that he might bring us to salvation. If you know him, you will want to repeat the words of the hymn that we were singing, 
Oh, what hath my Lord done? If you don't know him yet, there's nothing in the whole wide world so important for you that you should get to know him. Let's pray together. Father, we are bowed down before you because we are in waters too deep for us. We have no line with which to fathom the mysteries of redeeming grace or the mystery of iniquity which we see in our own lives and in our own times. Lord, in your mercy, teach us your truth and lead us afresh to your Son. For your great name's sake, amen.